Hello there. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Live from New York, it's Tuesday night. And welcome to the Linnaean Society's first speaker meeting of 2022. My name is Ken Chea. I am the um, uh, president of the Linnaean Society of New York. Um, and I'm having a bit of a problem with my screen share right now. So just hold on, a little technical difficulty. I'll be right with you. And there we go. Um, so once again, from the top, hello there. Good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. Welcome and uh, to the uh, Linnaean Society's first speaker meeting of 2022. My name is Ken Chea. I'm the president of the Linnaean Society of New York, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. Well, here we are at the start of another year of birding and nature appreciation. Uh, among many of our recent winter visitors here in New York City, there are snow geese being reported uh, on Governor's Island, uh, Iceland gulls and common golden eyes uh, being seen on Randall's Island here on Manhattan Island. We have a glauca skull on the Central Park Reservoir and a persistent Western tanager that continues in Carl Schertz Park on the Upper East Side. Great wraps of ruddy ducks mingling with buffleheads, northern shovelers, hooded mergansers, and scop have returned to our local waterways. An ash throated flycatcher continues to make appearances in Brooklyn's Owl's Head Park. Let's show Brooklyn some love. And speaking of owls, I hear that there are a few species of them being seen around town as well. So dress warm and happy, safe, and ethical burden to all. According to my participants list, let's see where we are. Oh, there's 64 people and they're coming in the door as I speak, 65 uh, here with us tonight. Um, so once again, a very warm welcome to everyone for joining us. I'm very excited about tonight's speaker. Tonight we have Dr. Jason Hill live from Vermont who will be sharing with us his research on altitudinal and latitudinal movement in montane birds. For tonight's program, we have disabled the Zoom chat feature as well as the video and microphone. The Q&A feature, however, is fully functional. And during this evening's program, we encourage you to use that feature at the bottom of your screen and send us any questions that you may have for our speaker. Following the presentation, our Vice President, Gabriel Willow, will take some time to select a few of your questions for Dr. Hill. Before we get underway with tonight's program, I have a few business items to cover, including the most recent results of our members voting, how to become a Linnaean Society member, and news about our upcoming annual meeting in March. But first, I have some sad news to report. Longtime Linnaean member Thomas Lovejoy passed away on December 25th, 2021. Tom joined the society in 1961. At the tender, tender age of 19, Tom was a husband, a father, an accomplished scientist, a consummate birder. And despite his moving to Washington, DC, where he served as vice president of the World Wildlife Fund and later as assistant secretary for the environment at the Smithsonian, Tom was a lifelong New Yorker. Tom's research led him to many, many exotic places. And over his long and distinguished career, he came to champion global environmental issues such as biological diversity, the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest and climate change. Among many other accomplishments, Tom popularized the term biodiversity. On behalf of the society, 
and its board of directors, we extend to Tom's family and friends our sincere condolences. A moving remembrance of Tom by his friend, Linnaean member Alexander Brash, will shortly be posted on the In Memoriam page of the Linnaean Society of New York's website. Another longtime local naturalist who also passed away in December was Mickey Maxwell Cohen. Although Mickey was not a member of the society, he was the 2012 recipient of the society's Natural History Service Award. Mickey was 94 and a lifelong educator, trip leader, and always, always <laughs> a familiar face at Jamaica Bay, Dead Horse Bay, Plum Beach, Coney Island, and indeed, Anywhere where water met land in New York City, you might very well run into Mickey Cohen. And if you did, you were in for a treat. On behalf of the society and its board of directors, we extend to Mickey's family and friends our sincere condolences. A remembrance of Mickey by his friends and Linnaean members will soon be posted on the In Memoriam page of the Society's website. Now, for those of you who had the good fortune to have known Tom or Mickey, but especially for those who didn't, please take a look for these articles, which will be appearing in the next week or so. The In Memoriam page may be found under the news in our main menu. And of course, our web address is LinnaeanNewYork.org. I will now report on the recent voting of our membership because we have some new members to welcome to the society. And thank you, thank you, by the way, to all of you dedicated members who send in your votes promptly. We love that. Motion one, to accept the December 2021 meeting minutes passed unanimously by a vote of 152 to zero with one abstent, abs, abstention. There's always one. On motion two, with 151 votes of approval, zero votes of opposition, and two votes of, of abstention, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the following five applicants as new members of the Linnaean Society of New York. Kathy Weiner, sponsored by Jean Shum. Maureen Heard Ryan, sponsored by Debbie Mullins. Stephen Klein, sponsored by Patricia Klein. Rick Cohn, sponsored by Sanford Sorkin. And Amanda Storty, sponsored by Janet Storty. If any of you newly elected members are out there right now, Congratulations to all and a very, very warm welcome to the Linnaean Society of New York. And now if anyone is wondering, how do I become a Linnaean Society member? Listen, it's really simple. Just go to our website. That's LinnaeanNewYork.org and you will find all the information that you need to apply. If you need a sponsor, and you don't know that many Linnaean members just yet, don't worry about a thing. We're a friendly and welcoming group. In fact, if you need a sponsor, I will be happy to sponsor you. You may contact me and any other officers of the society about sponsorship. That's the vice president, the treasurer, the secretary, the editor. All of our email addresses can be found at the bottom of the website's homepage under contacts. So just click on contacts and write to any of us officers about sponsorship or for more information. And please remember, any society or organization is only as healthy as its growing and diverse membership. We welcome all to become members of the Linnaean Society of New York, regardless of race, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, background, ability, or geographic location. We're a friendly group. 
we would be happy to hear from you. And if you love birds and nature and care about the environment and want to meet, meet people that share those same interests, we would be delighted to welcome you to our inclusive community of birders and naturalists. Finally, I'd like to update everyone on the Society's annual meeting. Because of the ongoing spread of COVID-19 variants and our concern for the safety of our members and guests, the Board of Directors has decided to hold the annual meeting of the Society live online this year using Zoom, just as we are doing tonight. The 144th annual meeting of the Linnaean Society of New York will take place on Tuesday, March 8th at 7 p.m. Please plan to join us and watch for a forthcoming invitation in February to register for our annual meeting. This online meeting is only open to Linnaean members and their guests. And now for tonight's feature presentation, Climate change is causing mountains to warm twice as fast as the rest of the world and mountaintops perhaps at five times the global rate. Distributions of many montane plant and animal species are already shifting poleward and to higher elevations. Data suggests that this rate of movement is increasing for certain species. In the Northeastern US, models predict that more than 50% of the Picea species, that is the, the balsam fir and the spruce forests, will be lost to upslope movement of hardwoods over the next two centuries. Unsurprisingly, species distribution models in conjunction with forecasts of climate change predict that most of the existing Breeding bird species of the spruce fir zone will be absent as breeders from the northeastern US by the end of this century. 10 years of community science data from more than 700 high elevation sampling locations from the Mountain Bird Watch program was used to model the elevational and latitudinal shifts in breeding bird species of the northeastern U.S., including that of Bicknell's thrush, black pole warbler, and white-throated sparrow. The hope here is that the results of Jason's research will help spur targeted regional and conservation movement actions and help improve future connectivity and species distribution modeling efforts. Growing up in Iowa, Jason Hill was fascinated by the way the natural world managed to exist in a heavily modified agricultural landscape. His biocentric wonder led him to New England, where he is a quantitative ecologist with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, helping to oversee the citizen science project, Mountain Bird Watch. A lifelong birder and naturalist, Jason followed graduation from the University of Montana with a series of wildlife-based studies that found him monitoring sea otters in California, tracking endangered red cockaded woodpeckers in Florida, and researching house wrens at La Selva Biological Station in Costa Rica. On Maui, his crew was tasked with capturing the three remaining Po'u'uli, a Hawaiian honey creeper that is now thought to be extinct. Jason investigated the post-fledgling ecology of salt marsh sparrows at the University of Connecticut for his master's in ecology and completed his PhD at Penn State University studying the population ecology of grassland sparrows following experimental landscape manipulation. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jason Hill. Jason. Oh, Ken, thank you very much for that introduction. I, I really appreciate that. It's, uh, uh, I wish I could say that it's great to see everybody. Um, 
it is, I am anxious like all of you, I'm sure for this, this pandemic to be over and for us back to be face to face. There's nothing more that I like being surrounded by uh, scientific minds and fellow naturalists um, asking me questions and interrupting me. If I wanted to hear myself talk for 45 minutes to an hour, I would, I just take a longer shower. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, really happy to be here. Thank you. I, I always start talking about the mountains by talking about, you know, where I got my, my, my did my master's work, as Ken said, it was salt marsh sparrows at the University of Connecticut with Chris Elphick. Most of us don't live on mountaintops, <laughs> unless you're the ruler of a small kingdom. And if you are, contact me. Um, you know, it's hard for us to relate to that. It's the place like we visit on the weekends. You know, we hike to the top, take a photo. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And you're down. It's not a place that you see on a day-to-day -day basis and you like recognize the changes that are slowly occurring. And if you've tried to hike to the top of a mountain in the last couple of years during this pandemic, you know that you know, peaks here in, in the ADK as well as the rest in, in, in New England are like all-time visitor level high. Um, you probably don't wanna hang out at the peak. You probably wanna get there, register or touch the summit and, and get out of there. Um, a lot of our mountain areas are just being overwhelmed, which is a great problem to have and a, a challenging problem to overcome at the same time. So salt marshes. Um, salt marshes and mountaintops really do share a lot of similarities. Uh, and I, I think I'm going to try to elucidate that for you. So salt marshes occur in this really linear strip of habitat along the Atlantic Ocean, you know, in a, between a rock and a hard place, between the ocean and more upland habitat and, and here in most of New England and in New York, you know, surrounded by the ocean on one side and then Boston Post Road, Highway 1, very expensive real estate on the other side of those salt marshes. And salt marshes get a lot of attention. I, I saw that it was great to see a picture of salt marsh sparrows in the introductory slideshow. Uh, that, that's, that's terrific. And you probably, a lot of you probably know a lot about salt marshes and the plight of the salt marsh sparrow. But, you know, sea levels along, along New York's coast in the Hudson Bay area, they've already risen by a foot since 1900. And sea levels projected to rise in New York State um, in the tidal Hudson zone, at least by another foot by the 2050s and another one to two feet perhaps by the end of this century. Just ponder that for a second. I know a lot of cities along coastal zones in the Atlantic, um, especially, especially Southeast Asia where, where, dis where displacement due from global sea level rise is gonna be the greatest, but also here along the Eastern seaboard of the US, a lot of people are already faced with that, and I know New Yorkers is, are as well. Salt marsh sparrows, as you can see from these photos here, they, they're ground nesters. And it's, um, it's amazing to me that you can even eke out a living at all by being a ground nesting bird in these grasslands. And salt marshes are absolutely grassland. They're dominated by Spartina alterniflora um, and a couple other grass species. Salt marsh sparrows have this really amazing mating system, even though it's such a challenging environment to try to eke out a living in. Um, salt marsh sparrow females do all of the work. The males, as far as we can understand, do absolutely nothing. Insert your own private joke there. The males just fly around and do nothing. The female, they said mate with females. The females literally, they build the nest, they do the, all the incubation, they bring all of the food to the young, they do everything. And that was what my, my master's work was on, was looking at, um, of mathematically looking at to identify a way for movements of when females and the fledglings became independent from each other to try to determine when the post-fledging period ended. But so these female salt marsh sparrows build these nests on the ground in salt marshes. And every day on average, twice, you know, you get a high tide and the water gently comes into the salt marshes and covers, you know, the salt marsh in a centimeter, a couple centimeters of, of salt water. That's what prevents woody vegetation and upland vegetation from establishing and what gives those, um, you know, literally half a dozen species of salt marsh plants an adaptive advantage to persist there. The eggs, if they're flooded, they will float in the nest. If the young, even though they're blinded and don't have their eyes open yet, they still know to climb up to the top of the rim of the nest. If the flood water comes higher, they'll cling to the edge of the nest desperately, wait for the flood water to recede and stay in the nest. It's, I mean, it's an amazing place. They can only do this because, you know, salt marshes are one of the most productive upland, uh, non-aquatic habitats in the world in terms of bioproductivity. So the female does everything, but what happens every 28 days is you have a spring tide and the salt marsh, you can see in these photos, this, the water level would go to the knees or the waist 
of some of these folks. And if you're a ground nesting bird, you, you obviously can't survive that. The eggs uh, float out of the nest, they become, you can't incubate them, the young drown. Um, it's, it's a tough place to be. If you get a high tide event, just a regular high tide event coupled with a heavy rain, then you can get an abnormal high tide at any peak during the lunar cycle that will cause flooding. And then you might have like a two week window and female salt marsh sparrows might try to lay eggs during that period, but there isn't long enough period there to lay eggs and have the, the eggs and young survive long enough to be able to fledge and leave the nest. So um, we, you know, published, so I said, you, or sorry, I should wonder. So you, you probably wonder like why, um, as, salt, as sea levels rise, you know, another couple of feet here by the end of this century in New York um, and in the coastal area of New England, why don't salt marshes just simply move up into the upland habitat, right? I mean, the sea level is going to rise. That's going to kill off woody vegetation, upland plants. The problem is it's physically impeded, just like a mountaintop, right? Salt marshes can't migrate up further into the landscape because they're, they're physically blocked by not only tidal restriction features and Highway 1, Boston Post Road, but really expensive real estate. Nobody, myself included, not going to volunteer to move your house back 100 meters. And there's houses behind you anyway, so you couldn't do that. So salt, marsh, salt marshes are going to be in between the ocean and you know Highway 1 and expensive real estate, and they're just going to do this until they're maybe gone. So some other you know statistical nerds, myself, um, friends of mine, put got together, took every piece of biological information we knew about salt marsh sparrows, probability of renesting, pro how many nests uh, they they female attempts a year, probability of those nestlings surviving, the probability of those nestlings being female versus male, every peaceable thing we know. And then we built a tidal cycle model and we built climate change into this model um, using UN uh, global climate change projections. And we projected populations out for salt marsh sparrows. How long would sea level be low enough to allow salt marsh sparrows, a ground nesting species to persist? And we estimate salt marsh sparrows have about 40 years left until they are globally extinct. This is a species that has declined by 75% since the 1990s. Um, and we, it's probably, they're probably declining 9%-ish per year annually. Um, for those of you who are like, 9%, oh, is that a lot? Let me ask you something. If your financial investor told you your retirement portfolio was declining by 9% a year, would you think that's a lot? You think that's a lot, let me tell you. Um, we estimate in 40 years, reproduction just won't physically be possible. The salt marshes will be flooded too frequently. The mean sea level will be too high for salt marsh sparrows to have a long enough period of time for them, for the females to lay eggs, hatch the young, and for them to fledge. This may be the first species that we lose directly due to global climate change. Now, how does that relate to mountains? On mountains, you have a lot of organisms, right, that occur at high elevations. Um, and they're at the peak of those mountains, and mountains aren't really getting any tire, any higher in a meaningful time frame compared to the lifespan of these organisms. And here in Appalachia, that's, that's not the case anyway. Um, our mounds are old and eroding. So you have a mountain peak, you have organisms at the top, and what are you gonna do as the temperature and environmental conditions change? You're gonna go up, you're already at the top of the mountain. You're gonna go north. You go north in New England much past, uh, you know, much past uh, Mount Washington, and you're going down in elevation. You're stuck just like salt marshes are between a rock and a hard place. Um, these organisms have a lot working against them in the face of global climate change. You know, as temperatures warm, these species have a reduced capacity to move upslope or poleward compared to those species whose core populations occur at lower elevations or lower latitudes. They have less wiggle room, if you want to say. So higher latitudes are on average warming much faster and mountains are warming, as Ken said in his, in his awesome introduction, twice as fast as the rest of the world and mountaintops perhaps five times as fast. We, amazingly, we don't fully understand why that is happening. Some, some scientists suggest that, uh, first of all, we need more weather stations on mountain peaks in the world. Um, we have plenty at airports, but we need more up high. Um, some folks suggest it's the albedo effect that as we reduce permanent snow and ice cover um, on much of these mountaintops, that the reflective light colored snow and ice is being lost for a greater portion of the year. And so that exposes darker colored bedrock and soil material, which is better 
um, able to absorb heat and retain it. And it's this, it's this um, feedback cycle, if you will. Um, but we, on, we honestly, we're, we don't fully understand why mountaintops and mountains in general are warming so much faster, but they are. You know, um, species have lots of options to respond to global climate change. And we have lots of forms, lots of ways to document that species have been for first century. Um, responding to global climate change. You know, species can make shifts in your in their phenology. If you're a flowering plant and it's getting warmer earlier, you could you could flower a little earlier and cross your fingers, cross your wings, that uh, that the insect that pollinates you is also emerging a little earlier. You can make changes in your morphology to adapt to that changing um, to claim changing climate or physiology, um, changes in your behavior. And of course, you can make changes in your distribution. Ms. Thurman um, kind of famously pointed out, you know, species have two general strategies. You can persist in place or you can shift in space. So I'm not going to talk so much about the changes in morphology and behavior that a lot of species undergo to remain in place uh, or to mitigate the effects of climate change. I'm going to talk more about how the species physically move on in response to climate change. So Perhaps unsurprisingly, you know, we have evidence from around the world that montane organisms from plants to butterflies to fish to you name it are responding to climate change by, by shifting up slope. And one of the best examples of that is, is North America, is American pika. So pika have been, because they're kind of easy to study, they, they mark their presence really well. They've been studied since the 1800s and we have decent records of their distribution. You know, this is a species here in North America at least that's out west predominantly at higher elevation peaks, um, you know, you know, um, and with a, the figure you see here from Robert et al. is an upslope rain retraction um, figure that's made um, to, to help you see the upslope movement of, of American pika um, over the last hundred plus years. So, and this is, I think this data is from the Great Basin, I'm pretty sure in the Western US. And you can see that they, they basically track the minimal elevational uh, threshold for these individual pika populations through time. And it looked how that the minimum elevation, the, the, the bottom line where pika can persist and above and see how that's changed over time. So you can see this, this historical line here at, at 2,374 meters, which is something like uh, 7,800 feet. You know, that's historically through the 1800s and presumably before. Um, and for the early part of the 19th centuries where you could find pika populations out west down you know, to that level. So through time, we have really good records of pika. People have been studying them for a long time. Um, and then traveling forward through 2008, you know, on average, these populations of pika have moved upslope by 195 meters. That's like 700 feet um, over the first half of the 1900s to 2008. Now, almost half half of that increase, almost 100 meters, occurred in just the last decade of their study. And since then, there's been a, another paper published I saw recently in Global Change Biology by Bill Men et al. to show that pika populations since 2010 have probably moved up another 85 meters alone in the last decade. So I take a couple of conclusions from this. For those species, um, most species we have nowhere near this kind of historical record for. Um, the species we do are almost exclusively birds, are very, you know, uh, classically attractive butterfly species or char you know, charismatic megafauna and, and, and some mammals. They're not the things that birds eat. They are not the cryptic things that are hard to detect. They are not the vast majority of organisms that we have records for this. But this pattern is clearly not linear. The, most of the change has happened in just the last couple decades. This is some kind of exponential increase in elevational upslope movement or some, some pattern even more complex and, and interesting than that. So this is you know, absolutely not an isolated uh, pattern. You know, I'll just say that you know, in Europe, we see mountain peaks that are being colonized by lower elevational plant species. There was a publication in, in Nature a couple years ago that showed that something like 85%, 85% of, of of mountain peaks in, in Europe are being colonized by lower elevation plant species due to warming climate at the top of those mountains. In the Andes, we see high elevation species over 1200 meters. They are much more likely to have shrinking ranges and much more likely to be decreasing in abundance compared to lower elevation species. Um, we see that same pattern from parts of Africa, from the South Pacific, from every continent. 
Um, and globally, you could say on average, we see species of distributions are shifting upslope at something like a rate of 11 meters per decade. That's, that's, that's a huge average of lots of different organisms moving at different rates. Um, so 11 meters upslope per decade and something to, you know, poleward shifts towards the North Pole in, North America, in the, the, the Northern Hemisphere at a median rate of something like, you know, 17 kilometers per decade is, is a good estimate. So this, this figure you see here from Fay et al. from 2017, you know, climate change has already changed um, everything here in the Northeast, um, almost everything here in the Northeast, really. And it's going to continue to change at this point, no matter you know, what we do. You know, observed trends that we've seen in historical weather climate data from the 1900s through now, you know, show that the mean annual temperature in our region, Northeast the US um, and in New York have increased by about two and a half degrees Fahrenheit with even greater periods of warming during the winter. Precipitation patterns are also changing. We're getting more precipitation in fewer events. So, you know, ironically, at the same time, we're experiencing greater drought stress because the rainfall, even though we're getting more of it, comes in, in greater, period, uh, greater amounts of time in between individual rainfall events. These projected climate train, chain um, trends using global, you know, downscaled climate data um, indicate that we're going to see a mean annual temperature increase for our region, something like three to eight degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century, which is just amazing to me. Um, you know, and so Spay and all studies already showing the effects of that. You're probably thinking, um, so these are these are tree species that you're seeing here. Each individual arrow, the green dot is the the latitudinal and longitudinal centroid of an individual tree species uh, 40 years ago at this point, 40 years ago. And the blue arrow and the green, the darker green dot is the where that centroid of that species has shifted during a 30 year period up through 2017. And what they found in their study was that the majority of eastern tree species have shifted northward and westward. So north, northwest, following ch changes, uh, changes in patterns of temperature and precipitation. You're probably thinking, how do tree species move? Right? They don't get up and walk around, um, except the nights with full moons when no one's looking. They, they pull up their roots, according to my six-year-old son. But for the rest of us, we know that tree species move basically through adult mortality or through increased recruitment. What happens here, you see species in the southern periphery of the range. It's getting hotter and drier and drier each year. They, at some point, will stop being able to produce seeds and nuts and fruit. They'll persist as an adult, but in a, in a, you know, a pitiful form. And you get a really bad year and boom, you get an insect disease outbreak and it wipes out a lot of the individuals on the southern periphery. On the same, you know, on the, on the op flip side of that, you have individual trees on the, on the northern periphery of the range. And each year it's getting a little better. Like you're like, hey, like, you know, Virginia pine or bald cypress or something like, hey, it's getting a little better here. And each year increases your ability to produce more and more, re more and more gametes, basically more and more seeds. And in the study, they found that it's it's actually that the and the individuals in the northern portion of the range are just throwing out so many more seeds um, as the climate becomes favorable that that's how tree species expand, shift their ranges over time. These are tree species, right? They're movable for the most part, except of course during certain parts of their of their life. What about flighted organisms? Uh, I'm sure a lot of you participate, like in Christmas bird in the Audubon Christmas bird count, and this is CBC data from the winter of 2005 and 2006 compared to, you know, 40 year period earlier. And the same thing here with the arrows, right? This shows you the, the mean centroid, latitudinal, and longitudinal uh, geometric uh, centroid of those species in the 1960s compared to 2005. And, um, you know, what you can see here is uh, a lot of the species in their study have shifted north and northwest following the same pattern you just saw for the eastern tree species, following changes in precipitation and temperature gradients. Um, it, it is worth pointing out that in this study, 27% of the bird species um, did not shift their ranges significantly. Uh, sorry, 27% of the species shifted their ranges southward or remained in place. And not every species is going to be able to shift up in elevation or to shift forward. There are, a lot, uh, there are lots of reasons why you might not be able to do that. And also, um, 
you know, it's just clear to me from, from that a quarter of these species weren't able to ship that there isn't a one size fits all strategy to global climate change for these individual species. Why might not you shift north? Well, all right, you might be dependent upon a food resource that is not yet responding to climate change. Um, and you shift north might mean you having less food or having food at a different time of year than you're used to. Right? You might have a physical feature of your habitat, something like you know, low shore, you know, sandy nesting islands or cliffs or, or rocky faces, talus slopes, um, uh, wetlands that aren't physically moving. And so you're stuck in a hard place there. You're gonna move without the habitat that you're dependent upon. Um, you may be prevented from moving through competitive interactions with um, competitors, through interactions with predators or parasitoids. They may be doing better, higher elevation or further to the north than you. And you moving in that direction might put you at a greater um, you know, risk of, of competitive disadvantage or parasitic dis, um, uh, or requiring greater amounts of parasites if you do so. So you may be better off, even though the climate's less preferable to stay in place. Um, your species may be greatly declining and you may be basically fighting for survival and individuals that move further across the landscape and further away from the center of the remaining individuals may be light, less likely to reproduce and successfully find mates. So they, those individuals and those genes may not get passed on, which results in individuals sticking tight. And then just from a statistical point of view, you know, a lot of the species that are uncommon or rare, the data are probably going to be too sparse like in Audubon in Christmas bird count data are for us to detect very small shifts and changes. Um, so let's talk about spruce fir and in the mountains. So, you know, a lot of you know spruce fir forests as the trees up on top of the mountains, right? Um, you know, if you go through the hardwoods and you transition into I mean, balsam fir and spruce species up top, they're basically our subalpine forests. And in Canada, these are, you know, the boreal forest, many of the, this is the, the majority of the forests up there. So, you know, there are lots of people interested in what climate change is going to do to forest composition. Not only people that have in financial investments in timber cutting, you know, 50 years from now, trees don't grow overnight. You have to plan far ahead in the future, but also people who uh, maple sugar, the maple sugar industry and all kinds of industries. So there are lots of people that are modeling trees into the future. And trees are an awesome for all you dendrologists, you know, trees are an amazing set of organisms to work with because they preserve their growth record inside the tree in terms of the tree rings. We can get climate data from the tree rings themselves or from other sources. And you have hundreds of years of records where you can build these models and look at, well, how did you know Northern Red Oak respond when things got drier and wetter? And what happened as American beach moved into this area? The record is preserved for us to look at. So, you know, dendrologists build these models on century scales. And what a, a th the three different researchers have basically come to the conclusion that over the next couple hundred years, we're going to lose more than half of the spruce fir forest in the northeastern United States. And that's shown in green on the left hand side of that figure. There is, and we're going to lose it to the upslope movement of maple beech forest. And there are areas where you're going to see spruce fir initially colonize new areas. But ultimately, that's just a, a fraction um, compared to the amount of area they're going to lose to the upslope movement. There, it, there is maple uh, fir forest, sorry, spruce fir forest on the right-hand side of this figure. The, the size of the pixels there just makes it such that it looks like it's completely absent. But you know, these three papers that have modeled this have suggested about a 50% overall net decrease in spruce fir. Given that, right, I think it's an entirely reasonable to expect to see shrinking populations and breeding ranges for organisms that predominantly or exclusively live in the spruce fir zone. So I don't want you to try to take comprehension of all this. I, I just want to acknowledge that I'm here mostly talking about birds tonight. I do a lot of research with invertebrates, uh, with pollinators and bumblebees and milkweed specialists now, luckily, and also uh, montane soil invertebrates. And birds get a lot of attention and disproportionately so. And someone like me who's an ecological modeler, I crave long-term data sets and other types of organisms that we have for birds. And I'm sure many of you here tonight have contributed to you know, CBC data. And, and, and I, I did my first postdoc with, with breeding bird survey data. So I'm sure a lot of you contributed to that and I greatly appreciate that. And I just so wish we had those kind of data sets for these other organisms. And uh, we couldn't just, we weren't, we didn't just have to keep holding up birds as an example. 
I put this figure up here. I just want to make you just remind you, right? Birds don't exist in a vacuum. I mean, birds, birds are in an eco and birds in the spruce fir forest, they are eating things, they are being eaten by things. And as a population ecologist, I fully understand that all of those things impact the population dynamics of birds. It is not just climate, it is all the other competitors and, and, uh, and parasites and, and parasitoids that interact with these species. All of the pictures, the photos you see here are organisms that are projected to suffer, are projected to have pretty substantial effects from climate change. And we can have, and this, these are multiple talks in and of themselves. Um, we can see fish populations. Uh, we're learning that, we're, that the, temp, the survival of roe and of uh, fry is the temperature of the air and the temperature of the water is critically important to their survival and growth. Hemlocks, you know, with the, with the, in, with the invasion of uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, which is a bug that basically inserts its mouth part in the hemlock and um, sucks out some of the hemlock juices. We predict, a, a lot of people think that hemlock is gonna be one of those species like, yeah, I remember grandpa when there used to be hemlocks. Um, it's, it's very likely that hemlocks are going to have large reductions in their presence on the landscape here. Over the next hundred years, we're seeing species of hyalation butterfly anecdotally are disappearing from areas. Um, I just want to acknowledge that. It's easy just to be myopically focused on birds and ignore the rest of the ecosystems. I just freely acknowledge as a data person that we just don't have the data to be able to fully present on all these different organisms like we do for birds, um, but that I'm, I'm aware. Um, these are some of the species distribution models that some of you've seen. These are great. This is the website I encourage you to check out by Audubon. It's the survival by degrees site. These are the kind of models that folks like me produce um, and that I'm involved in for, um, for one species. And, um, you know, basically here for, you know, blue-headed, um, I can't see the right-hand side of my figure, I guess, but, um, but for, you know, blue-headed vireo and, and Canada jay and boreal chickadee, you know, anywhere you see color is where that species currently breeds. These are, this is breeding habitat. Red means that these climate projection models for these species project that under a, a very modest, very moderate two degrees Celsius increase in, in temperature over the next hundred years. Areas in red are areas that are currently breeding that we expect to lose these species from breeding. Areas in yellow are also areas where there's, um, they're likely to disappear, but less, uh, the evidence is less strong there, but still likely. And, um, you know, species that we're likely to lose here in New York and in the Northeast United States are species like Lincoln Sparrow. Morning warbler, yellow bellied flycatcher, black pole, white throated sparrow, hermit thrush, winter wren, palm warbler, both cross, both crossbills and grosbeaks. We're going to lose like 30, 40 breeding bird species. And some of those are, are pretty common species that we experience around here. Um, on the flip side, it's going to be a really exciting time for you fellow birders out there. You know, I just, a couple months ago, I went and saw Vermont's very first Mexican sheertail hummingbird that just randomly showed up uh, 20 miles from my house. And a, a friend called me and said, hey, you gotta come see this thing. Uh, you know, this, the, this, per this homeowner said they got something strange in their backyard, let's go check it out. Vermont's first record. And I'm sure a lot of you have similar experiences with that. But, you know, species that we expect to gain here, um, like worm-eating warbler and um, cerulean warbler and hooded warbler in much greater numbers than we currently have, Anywhere you see green is where that species breeding range is currently and is likely to persist. Um, blue are areas where these species, we expect them to colonize in the next hundred years where they're not currently breeding now. So species we expect to gain in much greater numbers like field sparrow and towhees, but worm eating warblers, yellow throated warblers, yellow throated vireos, and about 30 or 40 species that we don't have as common breeders here will be common breeders here by the end of this century. Like blue-headed vireo, you think about it as like a you know forest bird. It's going to be a montane bird by the end of the century at the rate that it that it's moving. And I should point out that these results are real. These modeling results here are really similar to those of my friends and colleague Joel Ralston and Jeremy Kirschman. Um, they also use a GS you know GIS-based climate niche model and predicted basically that all the boreal forest birds in New York are going to be completely lost from New York by by the end of the century. So there's um, Lots of different folks who have tried different approaches and pretty much have all reached the same conclusion. So there are, you know, 
a, a tremendous amount of unknowns with these type of species distribution models. First of all, they are just built on climate, right? They don't include any of the really important interactions between you know, birds and their food items or birds and predators or, or competitors. Uh, quite frankly, we, we don't have that data. I don't know what the most important competitor is for black pole warblers um, in New York. We don't have those data for the vast majority of species. I don't know how their insect species are responding to changes in other and predatory insects that are eating them. We just, we just don't have the basic knowledge, natural history knowledge, to incorporate those relationships into these models. And quite frankly, speaking as someone who uh, develops models, we also don't have the complexity in our models yet to handle those relationships, even if we did. So these models are simplistic and they're based on climate and they're projecting that birds are gonna shift and are able to shift physically across the landscape to stay within this preferred envelope of climate, which is why we often refer to them as, as, as envelope models. Um, we, we do not have the attention span. We certainly don't have the dollars to try to actively manage each one of these species like we do for bald eagles or loons for that matter. Not even, not even close to possible. There will be some species like black pole warblers that are going to shift to the north. And you know what? It's gonna be unfortunate for our region, but 99% of black pole warblers already, already breed in Canada. Population, global population is globally secure. It's not a species we really need to worry about. On the other hand, there are species that are, the models predict like spruce grouse, that is an entirely different scenario. These models predict that they're gonna experience an, a net decrease in 86% of their existing breeding range. They're gonna be reduced to just very small and fragmented areas. And we could certainly talk about the negative impacts that occur for populations that are small, isolated and fragmented. Additional negative effects happen for them. We have species like Cape May warbler. Um, the future for that species is challenging to predict. Uh, the, the model results for, the, for Cape May and, and a handful of other species predict tremendous overall net loss of breeding range and reduction to a tiny fraction of their current range now. Those are the species that these models suggest we really need to concentrate our resources for. But these are just models and it's the famous you know, University of Wisconsin statistician, uh, someone I have great admiration for, George Box famously said, all models are wrong and some are useful. What we need is on the ground calibration of these models. You know, how fast are these bird species actually shifting their ranges? Will they will be able to keep up with climate change? Um, and does that rate vary across the landscape, not only with elevation and latitude, but other measures of landscape resistance? Um, because in the habitat, species distribution models and extinction risk models could directly incorporate rates of movement and you know, put basically governors on how fast these species are able to respond. And then we could look at what effect that is gonna have. Maybe Cape May will never be able to, maybe the, the, the center of mass breeding population, Cape May warblers is never gonna make it that far north um, in the next hundred years to keep up with climate change because maybe they just can't physically move that fast on the landscape. We don't have those data for many species yet. So that's where I come into with, with Mountain Birdwatch. Mountain Birdwatch is this amazing community science project that I just happened to manage. I was not one of the brilliant people that came up with the idea for this and put in all the hard and grueling work. I'm just a person sitting at the helm right now. Um, but basically for the last decade, each June, community scientists conduct these repeated point counts um, at 765 high elevation sampling stations from the Catskills to 80K to Katahdin. For those 10 bird species you see in the upper left there, plus red squirrel. And red squirrel is the, is the, is the most of abundant nest predator for most of these species. And has some really amazing population dynamics, if I say so myself. Um, you know, that's basically almost 30,000 point counts in these incredibly remote high elevation locations. They're all in hiking trails or in Maine, a few of them are on log, old logging trails. Um, so almost 30,000 point counts conducted by community scientists in these incredibly remote locations over the last decade, ranging from 550 meters in elevation to 1500 meters. So basically from where the spruce fir starts in the Catskills, all the way up to the edge of the Alpine on Mount Washington. Um, 
most of the speech locations are spruce fir, some are at the transition zone. So um, I'm incredibly thankful to all the community scientists who participate in Mountain Birdwatch each year. It's more than 100 folks, including the Catskills. And if you're interested in participating in Mountain Birdwatch um, and you like hiking and you like getting up at 3.30 in the morning to count birds in the dark in the middle of nowhere, wow, it's jackpot, maybe you just, you just hit the Community Scientist Project of the Year for you. So reach out to me. Um, so there are lots of approaches that we could use too. So if there are lots of ways that we could use Mountain Birdwatch data to look at have birds moved up slope and elevation and towards the poles over the last decade or so. Um, I see a lot of papers that do something like, you know, they take data from one year back in the 1970s and they go back to those same sampling stations and they collect the data again and they compare them. And that is absolutely a, a, a one approach. That's a valid approach. There is absolutely value in that. Um, the analysis you're gonna see tonight you know, basically I took all the mountain bird watch data from 2011, its first year and its modern reincarnation to 2020, uh, the last year that I had already an, uh, gathered and data proofs and everything. And I incorporated all 10 years into the analysis. And what that does, it greatly reduces the chances that the first or last year of the study, it's just a weird year, right? Even populations that are just completely stable, they're actually doing this, you know, or something like that every year. And if, even if they're completely stable and you randomly choose, choose two years, there's a chance you're just gonna make some erroneous conclusion based on the differences in the first and last year. And you don't want that. So by including 10 years, it, it averages out and makes it less likely some weird year throws off the analyses. It also greatly, for a statistician like myself, it greatly allows me to improve um, the ability of my model to, to, to borrow strength across the years, um, which is, which is in, if you have a year like 2020, where due to COVID, there were very few people were able to conduct their mountain bird watch routes. Um, a lot of the hiking trails were closed, overnight shelters on the AT, where a lot of these routes take place, uh, were closed. And so it was a very um, poorly sampled year, like 55% of the stations were sampled that year, which is still amazing. It's still this one of a kind in the world data set. Um, but we can make up for that borrowing strength from other years and looking at the relationship between abundance and elevation, for example, in other years as well. I am happy to talk about methods and models in the Q&A if you really want to know, but I'll, I'll just briefly say that basically, you know, I developed these end mixture and models in a Bayesian framework. I use two computer languages to do that and two computer programs is basically a blank screen and I write a thousand lines of code. And it takes me many, many months. And then I run these models and they run for days for individual species. They, um, I generate hundreds of thousands of estimates of what I'm gonna show you. And then I compile all those together. So it's not just, what's my best guess? It's what's my best two, 200,000 guesses, guesses. And I put them together. Um, in these models, so in mixture models, not important for you to know, but basically they estimate local abundance and they account for imperfect detection. Nobody detects every single bird within 150 meters of them. You miss some. And that's why observers do back-to-back-to-back -back -back counts. So I can statistically estimate how many birds did you miss of each species. Um, that's invaluable. And actually in the last couple of years, observers are quantifying background noise, like from ephemeral water. A loud stream really makes it hard to hear. And if they record the background noise, I can actually estimate the birds they missed due to the presence of high, um, high levels of background sound. Um, in these models, I allow for interactions between year and elevation. Um, and I use, you know, uh, a very, I, I use a bunch of different um, forms for that relationship, univariate and quadratic. Um, and there's a model selection procedure I'm not gonna talk about, but basically I take all these hypotheses, make them fight each other for the winner and see who comes out on top. So I'd say every approach, including mine, has its drawbacks um, when you're trying to estimate shifts in the breeding, shifts in a species global breeding population. Um, but I basically wrote this custom function that looks at what is the elevation where half of the Bicknell thrush, for example, occur below that elevation each year and half of the Bicknell thrush in the Northeast United States, Northeastern United States occur above that because you wouldn't want to just use like, what's the highest elevation of Bicknell thrush was detected at? That's just one individual. Is that meaningful for the population the entire species? I don't, probably not. But looking at the 50% 
you know, um, I think that's, that's meaningful and that's really defensible. And that's what I did in this analysis. So I can compare that 50% elevational threshold for each year to see if it's increasing or decreasing or doing nothing. Um, and it's the same thing for latitude as well, right? With the 50% latitude. So, um, and just to be clear, and I'm really proud of this, you know, we, uh, my modeling approach explicitly takes all the uncertainty. Nothing is estimated, you know, with no uncertainty, but I take all that uncertainty, you know, I pack it up in a backpack and I take it through every step of the model and I make all these hundreds of thousands of guesses. And I don't pretend that any guess is perfect. All the uncertainty around each guess comes forward in the model, which is why it takes days for these models to run on an Amazon web server virtual computer for me. So let's jump into results. Um, so here, yeah, so this is just, you know, one hypothetical, you know, shift in, you know, so we have density of some imaginary species on the Y in elevation. You could see over 10 years, this is a plausible hypothesized um, shift, right? Let's look at the results for one species. This is yellow belly flycatcher. It's declined overall by something like 22% in our study area over the last decade, um, declining everywhere. And here, um, and, and so yeah, so basically the dark, uh, the dark line in the middle there is my best guess for the number of individuals within 100 meters of all the mountain bird watch sampling points each year. So um, I'm gonna try to, this is complicated because elevation and latitude are changing at the same time. The relationship between abundance of these yellow belly flycatchers and elevation and latitude are all changing simultaneously. So I'm gonna try to break this down. Here, I'm gonna show you a, a panel for each year. So you see 2011, you have, um, it's predicted abundance on the Y and it's elevation on the X axis down here. And again, it varies with latitude, which is why you see a green line for the area around Katahdin. That's the relationship between elevation and abundance for yellow belly flycatchers around Katahdin. And then you see the purple line um, there for the Catskills. So each one of these lines has their own, there's 95% Bayesian credible intervals around it. And I'm, I'm just not showing that because it would make the figure impossible to, to interpret. So I'm, I'm removing that for clarity, but please, understand that it is there. So let's look at how this relationship between density and elevation in the Catskills and in Katahdin have changed. So here's 2011. I, I think you can pretty see a pretty clear relationship there. The predicted abundance for yellow belly flycatchers from our 30,000 point counts over the last 10 years uh, has declined across all elevations in the Catskills. Um, and at lower, and it just at lower elevations around Katahdin, but has increased at higher elevations around Katahdin. Um, this matches with, you know, what we're seeing. I think um, in the Catskills over the last 10 years, I think within the Mountain Birdwatch data set, yellow belly flycatchers have declined by over 70%, 70% decline in a decade, and increasing only in and in, in then Maine, they're declining by, I want to say 11% overall over the last decade. So declining everywhere in our entire study area, but by far declining the most in the Catskills, which is what my friends and colleagues, um, uh, Joel Rawson and Jeremy Kirschman predicted with their models for New York. So let's look at that relationship for yellow belly flycatchers and see how it varies with latitude over a decade period. So again, it's predicted abundance of yellow belly flycatchers on the Y. You have two lines here. You have the orange line representing a 1200 meter elevational band. It's just, I arbitrarily chose that to show you the difference between a, you know, um, a, a mid, mid elevation site and then 800 meters is a pretty low elevation site. You can see there's the blue line stops at 43 degrees latitude. There really is no spruce fir in the Catskills at 800 meters. It's too low. It'd be hardwoods at that point. So here we again are 2011 and let's scroll forward. Right, so quite similar to elevation, you can see predicted abundance decline throughout our study area at um, relatively low elevations while increasing only at higher elevations at higher latitudes. This matches not only the patterns we see from other monitoring programs, um, including breeding bird survey, um, but matches mountain bird watch data very well. Um, I should say that other programs like, like breeding bird survey 
have a, a, a tiny fraction of the number of yellow belly flycatchers in the sample set that we do in ours, because those counts are conducted on roads. Our counts are conducted in the spruce fir zone on hiking trails and are designed to detect, are designed to give us high encounter rates for these individual species. So putting everything together for yellow belly flycatchers, you see on the left-hand side of this, this double wide figure here, they're estimating, my models estimate that yellow belly flycatchers over a 10 year period shifted upslope by 27 meters. This vertical line is the 95% credible interval. It's just how uncertain we are about this, which is our very best guess. This dotted line here represents zero. So substantial amount of evidence suggesting that yellow belly flycatchers have moved substantially upslope. You remember earlier I said something like 11 meters per decade upslope is a good estimate for global background. So here we have something that's twice that rate. The latitudinal shift you see over here on the right, and that's much more you know, modest. I, I said something like that global rates may be something closer to 20 kilometers, 15 to 20 kilometers, and this is like more like five kilometers. So it doesn't appear the yellow belly flycatchers are terribly moving towards the North Pole. So putting, I'm not going to walk you through all those individual species. You're welcome. But here's the summary of all those results. And I'll just give you a, a second to look through these here. And there's a lot of surprises. Now, as if you know a lot of naturalists and other scientists, it'd be really easy to try to spin some story for every single one of these. Well, winter wren, you know, moved down slow because, uh, you know, it's dry that last decade. And, um, you know, um, uh, it, it remains to be seen what is the overall pattern driving these results. And this study can't really get at that, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a second. Um, but this is the, yeah, so here for all the species, you see our model predicts that species like white-throated sparrows and yellow belly flycatchers and black poles are substantially moving upslope. And species like yellow belly flycatcher and big nels and um, in Swainson's are moving modestly, but moving northward towards the poles and some other species are seeing an increase in the southern part of our study area. So let's see if we, here we go, sorry. So if we look at the relationship between the annual population trend, like how well the species is doing, zero means the species is flatlined. They're not increasing or decreasing, they're just totally stable. And we can look at that and compare that to how these species are shifting elevationally and latitudinally. I am not including black cap chickadees in this particular part of the analysis. You can see that black cap chickadees, which are an abundant bird in your backyard, uh, are doing something different than the rest of these species. Black cap chickadees are ex basically increasing everywhere in the Eastern United States at every elevation, everywhere, every type of habitat. And in, in the mountain bird watch study area, which is predominantly spruce fir, they're increasing at something like I should have written that down, but something like, I think it's like 11 something, 11% 11 per year, which is phenomenal. I mean, it's, in, it's incredible, um, which is a pattern we see that generalist species are responding, generalist species are in general responding better, specialist species, not so well to global climate change. But black capped chickadees increasing everywhere and they're not a part of this particular analysis. Um, but what you see is that for species like white-throated sparrow and yellow-bellied flycatcher and black pole, um, those species are declining more rapidly, are also the species that are moving upslope most rapidly. Uh, perhaps this suggests to me that those species forced to move upslope, and those are the species that are declining the rap most rapidly, that those are the species that are most sensitive to changes in climate in our data set. That is one possible explanation. I'm lucky to be working to helping to advise a student at uh, University of Vermont who is looking at, uh, looking at characteristics of these bird species themselves. Are, are they short or long distance migrants? Um, you know, how insectivorous are they are? Um, their nesting habitats and all these things to try to look at characteristics um, of the birds themselves, not only morphology, but natural history to see, are there patterns there that we can see like short distance migrants appear to be the ones that are not responding, not moving up slope and that long distance migrants are the birds that are moving the most upslope. Um, but those, the, those, the, that work will be done by the end of this year and I'm really excited to see what they, they come up with. So, and then here again, excluding, lat, excluding black capped chickadees from this analysis, you can see you know, the, the population trend, annual population trend compared to the latitudinal shift. Um, 
And we see species, so almost all the species in our study are declining, right, are below zero. Um, you have Big Nell's thrush way out here on the right. That's the species that is the least declining, I guess we could say. But for those species whose trends are approaching positive territory, and those are the species that were more likely to see shifts to the north. These are species like Big Nell's thrush and, and, and white-throated sparrow and yellow-bellied flycatcher and Swainson's. And that's really interesting to me. And I, I'm having a, honestly, I have a hard time understanding some of that. I think part of it is the fact that we're at the southern periphery of these species breeding ranges, and we have the Catskills in there. And from the Catskills, you have a big, big gap between, and latitudinally, between where many of these species pick up again. You have the Catskills and spruce fir habitat, and then it's a hardwood forest habitat for quite a while. In southern Vermont, we pick up uh, spruce fir habitat again. Well, I think what is happening is for species like Bicknell's thrush, I don't think they're moving to the north. In fact, my Canadian colleagues tell me that they're retracting the northernmost parts of their range in the maritime provinces, that that is where Bicknell's thrush is most rapidly declining in the northern part of their range. Taken together, what this suggests for me for some of these species, and this is classic pattern you see um, across organisms when populations are declining, is like Big Nell's thrush is declining in Canada at the northern periphery of the range, and they are rapidly declining in the Catskills at the southern periphery, and it's shrinking basically towards the whites. And in our data set, losing them from the Catskills, but we don't sample in Canada for this in, for Mount Birdwatch, it looks like the species is moving north. And I think what actually is happening is we're just losing them from the most southern part of the range, and the average makes it look like they're moving northward. Um, the data on across the landscape do not support that Bicknell thrush are moving north. I'm part of a modeling project using Mountain Birdwatch data and Bicknell thrush data, and those population projections, those species distribution models that I showed you earlier for like um, spruce grouse and Cape May, they do not predict that for Bicknells. They predict that Bicknells is going to lose you know, something like 90% of its breeding range and just shrink towards the White Mountains over the next hundred years. So. A lot of work to be done on this, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited to continue to work on this. Um, that's what big data sets do. And I, like I said, I really wish I had these big data sets for other organisms. Uh, what does the future hold for 2100, you know, in the next 100 years? Oh, well, maybe 3 billion more people on the planet um, and a whole lot of change. You know, like I said, it's going to be an exciting time for a lot of people as species shift their ranges on the landscape as we see more bird rarities um, show up as species are more moving around and climate becomes more suitable in places it wasn't before. We're gonna see things that we never thought were possible for shifts in, in species, um, not just birds, but in terms of like Virginia pine and bald cypress and other species that are going to be coming into the Northern part of the United States and becoming uh, a common species here, tulip poplars, for example. I, I think we, we critically have to think about birds from a 10,000, 10,000 foot view. I mentioned that, you know, we can't manage each one of these species individually. You probably saw the science paper came out a couple of years ago, um, heavily covered in the press about declines of North American birds. Um, and here we, you know, have something like one third, we have one third fewer bird species, one third fewer individual birds since the 1970s. Grassland birds and boreal forest birds are the two groups that declined the most in that. Good or bad, the, the groups that were responding the most positively over that same period are birds that are heavily managed. Species like bald eagles, where individual nests are protected. Species like ospreys, where you build nest platforms. It's not forest boards. You, know, you can't go out and put out a nest box for a big nail thrush. Um, it's species like ducks and species that were able to do direct intensive and, and, um, um, and management actions for those species. We won't be able to do that for all these species. Um, we're just not. We're going to have to identify which species are most vulnerable and concentrate our resources there, unfortunately. One thing we can do that will benefit all species, not just birds, but species like moose and mountain lions and, 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 and bats on the landscape, migrating bats, is preserve corridors of habitat. I'm really you know, pleased that the Vermont Wildlife Action Plan has been way ahead of this in identifying you know, blocks of contiguous forest habitat. You know, we may not be able to intervene and manage these species individually, but we have to preserve the components of the landscape to allow those species to physically move across the landscape 
as their ranges do inevitably shift. And we will not be able to stop that. Um, I would just say, you know, if somebody wants to ask, uh, so I'm a lifelong birder and I'm a former eBird editor. I have lots of thoughts. If you want to improve the quality of your checklists in the mountains, I have a lot of tips for you on how to do that to make your data that much more valuable if somebody wants to ask me about that. Um, but I will just say, you know, um, like the Christmas bird count results, you're going to see a lot of surprises over the next 100 years. People like me are not going to get it all right. Some of the things that our models predict are going to be wrong. And some of the species we thought are going to be okay are not going to be okay. Um, you know, um, we're going to be at the end of the century in a much better position to look for commonalities across species um, to see how they're responding to climate change. And that's to identify commonalities based on their diet preferences and migratory status and other life history traits. We don't have this amazing data set like we do for Mountain Birdwatch for all of our bird species, and we're never going to have that. We're going to have to shortcut it and identify those, those traits, behavioral and morphology and natural history traits that allow us to short chain, the, you know, shortcut the system and predict which species are most going to be vulnerable. Um, and you know, this understanding along, along with documenting the rate at which species can physically move on the landscape is going to be really critical. As you talked, remember from the pika example, it's not a linear rate of increase. Species can suddenly ramp that up and dramatically shift in the rate at which they're moving upslope and poleward. So having those basic documentation of how fast species can move upslope and poleward is going to make us in a much better position to manage and conserve montane birds because we're going to be able to directly incorporate those rates of movements into our models and into our management plans. Um, I think Ruth and Ken and Gabriel, everyone else here tonight, I, uh, I really wish I could be there in person. It'd be great to hang out a lot of you after this. And um, thank you for everyone. Don't forget to buy your habitat stamps. It's an easy way to support birds. And um, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure. Happy to take some questions. All right. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, oh, and, and uh, there we yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> hey there, everybody. This is Gabriel Lowe, uh, Vice President of the Linnaean Society of New York, and I'm going to be uh, helping facilitate the Q&A uh, for the, the viewers. Go ahead and drop your questions into the Q&A chat uh, box there on the lower right of your screen. Um, that was fantastic, Jason. Thank you. Um, uh, it, it, it made me think of, there's a, a mural that yeah. it, it did. You've done so many things. It's incredible. I mean, the salt marsh sparrow research and the Uli and and in and of course in the mountains in Vermont and and in the tropics. Uh, you're right. You were in studying, doing research in Costa Rica. You, you had your post up. Amazing. I don't know how you get all this done. And then you also write computer modeling code. It's it's pretty mind blowing. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> remarkable the scope. And, Work that you do, I can't believe it. Um, so thank you. That was very comprehensive. Um, uh, so we do have a couple of questions here, um, and 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 a few more are popping up. Um, I think everybody probably has seen it to absorb everything that you covered. Um, it, it actually it made me think there was of a of a painting. There's a mural that was in the Brooklyn Museum here in Brooklyn. I don't know if it's still by an artist. And Alexis Brockman. It's called Manifest Destiny. It was this huge 20-foot mural, and it showed Brooklyn in in, the, in a somewhat dystopian future in the wake of climate change. But and the Brooklyn Bridge is underwater. We'll probably be breeding here at some point. There's a nesting roseate spoonbills off the side of the Brooklyn Bridge, and that that milk pops into my head a lot. So I'm like, yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> I mean, there was white ibis nesting in in Cape May, New Jersey, the last couple of years. So. So that part's exciting, like you said, uh, and then some of it's very disturbing and very sad. So it's sort of a range of emotions as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So let's see here. A couple of eBird related questions. Yeah. Uh, one person says, can you give eBirds on how to make our eBird data more valuable? This is, is great. Like I'm a dedicated eBird user, but to hear from you, the person who outputs the, that data and, and utilizes it is great and a great opportunity. So yes, yeah. how can we make our eBird data great, better? Great question. Wish I would have thought of that one myself. Um, 
I could say is, uh, you know, first and foremost, I mean, I'm a birder and I just I enjoy birding. And, you know, that's often my motivation for submitting eBird checklists. I'm on iNaturalist a lot. Um, and I, I contribute greatly to, uh, you know, observations of natural history um, on, a, on a naturalist, which is an amazing program. I encourage you to check that out if you don't know that. Um, and we also help manage eButterfly as well. One of our biologists, Kent McFarland does, which if you're familiar with eBird and you like butterflies, check out eButterfly. Um, what can you do? Um, you know, one of the first things I tell people is when you are doing a, when you want to go up to the mountains and you want to go take a look for, you know, you know, big nail thrush or something, um, as a reviewer for eBird for more than a decade, really frustratingly, I would see a lot of checklists that are traveling checklists. And it's clear that, you know, somebody like me got out of their car, awesome intentions, started a checklist, hiked up a mountain, and spent the next couple of hours on a single checklist. Montane birds are incredibly sensitive to elevation and changes in habitat. By merging all of that data into a single checklist, and you, you know, you, on your checklist, you can't say, oh, I saw big nails at you know, 1,200 meters, not at 700 meters. Um, it really minimizes the value of those data, it becomes more presence absence. If you instead just stopped every 30 minutes, took a breather, did a five minute stationary point count, that would be dramatically more valuable data from a check checklist perspective for ecological modelers like myself. Um, so that would be my biggest tip. When people like me analyze eBird data to do species distribution modeling and climate projection modeling, obviously there's a lot of data from a very few locations. I myself have a hotspot near my house and it's really tempting to go there. And I've added some new species there, sure. But for the most part, your efforts are being duplicated by somebody else. And when we do those modeling efforts, I can't use a thousand observations of roseate spoonbill from one location. That would just skew the data. The model would come out thinking like, oh, that's the only place in, in the Eastern United States where roseate spoonbills breed based on the number of checklists. And that's not the case. So what modelers like myself do is basically we impose a grid onto all the eBird checklists for, for roseate spoonbills or black poles. We have this grid, maybe it's you know two kilometers by two kilometers and we randomly choose one observation each year and we throw out all the rest. That's right, all of the rest of your data, 99.% of it don't often get used for the majority of the models that people like me develop. Um, we just can't because they're just basically duplicates. So if you want to increase the chances that your checklist is unique, that it gets included, easiest thing to do is to contribute more of your birding effort, effort outside of hotspots. Take a look at the species distribution map for the city and look to see you know, where any species you're interested in has not previously been identified um, and go there and put some dots on the maps. Have folks like me having more dots, especially in marginal habitats, helping us to find what are the edges of you know, black pole warbler acceptable habitat? You know, what is the minimum, the lowest elevation with the maximum elevation where it's too alpine? And they're not going to breed. Helping us to define those those marginal characteristics are invaluable because often these models that people like me develop do most poorly at the edges of the species ranges. You know where where the data often are very sparse. So so do a stationary checklist while you're on mountains at multiple elevations, um, and uh, and pick some place that's not a hot spot. Go out and try to add some dots to the map. Those things alone will immensely improve the scientific value of your data and have still have fun. I mean, still enjoy yourself or there's no point in doing it, but, you know, Ebert used to have like this random that is, checklist uh... feature that would try to encourage you to go to random locations. It's still there. Unfortunately, very few people actually submit data that way. And it's a, it's, you know, it's, it would take, it takes most of us like a lot of, to wrap our minds like, I don't know where I'm going. Let me just spin the wheel and, um, oh, it's private property. Can't go there. Okay. That's oh, private property. Can't go there, you know, but I love the idea and it's to encourage people to think outside their birding box. That's really good, really good advice. Yeah, I, I'm i guilty of the excessively long uh, cross altitudinal <laughs> gradient checklist problem, but you know, there's uh, this and the reviewers there are 
are very strict. And so a lot of my checklists got flagged or rejected because I, or hit, I guess, public output. Because mm -hmm. I, yeah, I would like um, kind of just keep this going for a couple hours. So it's a good reminder. Oh yeah, you really technically you're supposed to start a new checklist every 30 minutes or so. And most of us don't do that. Um, and that, that if you're crossing altitudinal, yeah, boundaries, that, that matters a lot. Now, now for the, for the going to a non hotspot for, for uh, those of us in New York City, an uh, interesting phenomenon is that pretty much all public green space almost is a hotspot. But yeah, if you're out in Vermont or somewhere rural, that's not necessarily the case at all. So oh, yeah. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, this is a kind of a, a, a philosophical question or, or maybe just an approach. How do you respond to people, uh, especially non-birders, who say, uh, so what? So the salt marsh sparrow goes extinct. Who cares? It's just a little sparrow. Like, what difference does it make? Um, what do you encounter that, and and how do you respond? Oh, do I encounter that? You know, honest, on, on Gabriel, I, I I don't think I honestly do encounter that. Um, That's good. You know, very much. I mean, I give quite a few programs. I mean, I I think the audience probably biases that. If I was still riding the bus to work every day um, in the winter and talking to everyone and forcing everyone to listen to what I do, I'm sure I'd get a lot, you know, broader segment of opinions. Like that sounds like a waste of time. Why would you do that? Well, yeah, um, you sound like my six year old. Um, I, you know, in any any one species, unless it's some species like in classically in ecology, think of like a keystone species or some species that has hugely disproportionate effect on the ecosystem, you know. Um, there's great redundancy built into ecosystems. We know that ecosystems are more stable and in all times of um, greater ecosystem processes when communities are more diverse in general. Um, so each species contributes to that. Any individual one species, you know, and especially birds, you know, really it's plants and fungi and bacteria and parasites that are really driving ecosystem processes and ecosystem functions. So, um, would the world dramatically change if salt marsh sparrows disappeared? You know, the, re the real answer is, is probably no. You know, that's a sad thing to say. Um, for the ecology of the salt marsh, uh, salt marshes would go on. Our lives would be a little bit less rich. Um, there'd be certainly less protection for salt marshes and less conservation focus on those remaining species. A lot of us don't get emotional or charismatic uh, about endangered plants or endangered invertebrates. Um, and so for better or for worse, birds often serve as the umbrella for serving to protect these other habitats. When we lose a specialist from those habitats, we're often losing our, um, what do you wanna say, our, our, our model, our, the, the species that we hold up is the reason why we need to protect this habitat to make it easier for people to get on board. Um, I think that's a tough reality, but that's probably my, that's my personal opinion. Yeah. Yeah, so they can be kind of an umbrella species. Yeah, conserve others in the habitat. Yeah, that's, that's a that's a good answer. You know, I feel that um, way about you know people feeding birds in the backyard. There's lots of scientific evidence, peer-reviewed work about you know what that does to bird populations. It it benefits a very small proportion of the bird pop of the species in general. Um, a lot of people rightly point out that bird feeders are great places to spread disease, and and there's all kinds of challenges associated with feeding birds. We don't feed other groups of organisms, but feeding birds results in lots of public passion and interest in birds because they're able to see them in a concentrated area in their backyard. And is that overall a positive thing? Yep, sure is. Um, and it probably negates the, the any, probably negates the negative effects of spreading disease among chickadees and house finches, unfortunately. Um, I had a question about, there was a question about, um, what are some of the differences between types of habitat loss in terms of um, habitat loss caused by climate change and the ways the habitats are shifting versus fragmentation and, and suburban sprawl? And mm. like, do those create distinctly different conservation challenges or impact oh, yeah. on birds or are they, is habitat loss habitat loss? That's an awesome question. Um, that's a huge, re that's a huge question. Um, um, you know, I will say this, you know, uh, Tom, I, I was sorry to hear that about Tom Lovejoy. Um, I didn't know Tom, but I know of his work. Tom like famously predicted something like 
10% or 20% of species would be extinct, of the world's species would be extinct in his lifetime. And, you know, we are in this period, sixth period, you know, this Holocene, the, the Anthropocene, uh, mass extinction event. The difference now is that humans are driving this extinction pattern, but that the global background rate of extinction is something like 100 to 1,000 times higher than the average background rate um, prior to this. That's staggering. What is the difference is when we, when glaciers removed habitat and when glaciers removed lots of trees from New York, I'm sure there weren't a lot of big nail thrush um, breeding right behind the glaciers when the Wisconsin glaci glacial uh, sheet pushed through. But um, when, the re when, the, when, the, when the glaciers retreated, natural habitat had an opportunity to reclaim that land. And it took, it took you know, I'm sure it was, um, well, it took, it took a long time, it took a long time. With people modifying the landscape, I have less confidence that that's the case. Is it possible large sections of New York City will be rewilded, uh, made into natural habitat at some point? I don't, I don't know. States like Vermont, we have very strong protections for um, undeveloped space. And the reason why, not because um, we don't want people to come here, please come here, but um, it's because we realize once that habitat is, is fragmented and lost to development, that's likely maybe not permanent, but it's very long-term and will likely have effects on the, the species there that will um, be very long-term as well. So yeah, so there is a difference there. The difference is that when humans modify the landscape, the landscape is often, not always, I can think of lots of examples where it is, but often not given an opportunity to return to a wild state following that disturbance. It's maintained as, you know, I grew up in Iowa where 82% of the land is corn and soybeans. I mean, it's depressed. I mean, and I go back, you know, I just went back for the holidays and like everywhere you looked, you know, it used to be short and tall grass prairie and these beautiful hardwood forest bottoms. And it's just literally all you can see is corn and soybean fields. That ain't gonna change anytime soon. Um, so yeah. Yep, that, yep, that's, that's um, very interesting. Um, a couple questions about uh, um, things that bird feed on. Um, someone asks, uh, do hummingbirds that have migrated to new habitats, I, I guess like range expansion, I assume we're talking here, utilize a new food source hmm. or has the, their food source kind of shifted range, migrated, if you will, with them? Oof. Well, um, that's a great question um, that I'm, 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 I don't know that specifically for hummingbirds, I don't know. I mean, often rare hummingbirds are detected by coming into to hummingbird feeders um, where they're feeding off sugar water. I'm trying to think if I've seen any papers that have actually quantified, you know, some rare hummingbird that's shown up and, and then followed that bird around and recorded the species of flower that it's drinking nectar from, or the insects. Insects are really insects and arachnids are really important for hummingbirds, sources of protein. Um, I don't know that I that's been documented. Um, I'm gonna guess that Mexican you know shear tail that showed up here in Vermont this fall uh, was eating everything new. Um, you know, structurally and and I'm sure things looked very similar and others oh, applying something I'm going to grab it and there's a flower it looks tubular I'm going to stick my bill in it um, I don't know that's a good question I don't know that's really been quantified um, some families of birds are well demonstrated to be much more adaptive and exploratory in food corvids uh, like crows and ravens and jays are famously very good at learning to eat novel food so are starlings and some other families and that's probably why they're really sick, their worldwide presence and really successful invaders is because they're not afraid to, what's that blue thing? Eh, I'll try it, you know. Yeah. And uh, another um, question about the relationship between birds and their food sources, in this case, insects. Um, if there's shrinking populations of insect birds, do you anticipate greater numbers of insects in certain habitats, and how might that impact the biodiversity in those areas? Sorry, I missed that. So fewer insectivorous birds, will there be? If, if 
this uh, fewer insectivorous birds, will insect populations go up, and then how might that subsequently impact the oh, biodiversity? Yeah, I, that, so I, I often tell people, um, and um, you can't be passionate about birds if you're not also passionate about insects. Uh, just, you just if if you find yourself in that situation, I strongly encourage you to think think hard about what birds eat for a big portion of the year. Um, birds. Uh, I can think of some good ecological examples where birds do exert top-down control on insect populations. Yep. In in general, I don't think that's the case. And there's certainly not widespread evidence that birds are top-down controlling insect populations. I think the, you, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about, so if insect herbivorous birds blinked out and insect birds are facing tremendous challenges, um, uh, not only North America, but around the world, if they did blink out, would insect populations suddenly bloom? No. No. Um, what most people who study insect population dynamics think is that it's not birds that are suppressing insect numbers compared to 50 years ago. Um, it's our, you know, industrial agricultural system and persistent use of pesticides in land and habitat change. And it's, it's not bird's fault. And you can quote me on that. It's not bird's fault. <laughs> Right on. That's interesting. I, I think the popular assumption is that if you didn't have little songbirds, we'd just be up to our next thing, you know, mosquitoes or caterpillars or something. That's interesting to hear. That's not necessarily yeah. the case. So, I mean, talk, you know, the thing, about, the thing is that, you know, birds, um, certainly birds prey switch, you know, when you have locally abundant food resource, birds will switch lots of species have been documented switching to one abundant species. When that species becomes less abundant, they switch to something else. But that's kind of how it works. You know, that's one of the challenges with using, say, introduced paras parasites and parasitoids for, you know, for invasive species control, unless it's a really tight relationship where that parasitoid only affects that one invasive species. As the, prey, as the, the density of that introduced species gets really low, the, paras the parasitoids like, well, I don't know, you know, die or try to infect something else. I think I'll infect something else. Um, and you see the same thing with predators with shifting to more abundant food resources. And, you know, that's why, uh, yeah. So I, I don't think that's the case. Could you have like, you know, a case where you have a pair of thieves in your backyard and it's exerting local control on some population of insect in your immediate backyard? Maybe, maybe. Um, I'm not familiar with, literature that demonstrates that, but I certainly think it's possible. Yeah. Um, I think this will be our last question for the evening. Um, I want to ask, is there any advantage to using automated bird monitoring systems to determine bird density? That's an awesome question. And we are, um, I am very pro automated systems. Um, I had a person approach me who is hearing impaired and they really wanted to participate in birding programs and uh, they felt not valued um, in other programs they tried to participate in. I'm all about that. Um, I think if, you know, be them hiking out, placing one of these automatic recording units, we call them ARUs, um, out in the middle of nowhere and then, you know, having it programmed to record at a certain period of time. That's awesome. There are challenges to using ARUs. And the biggest challenge is compared to a human observer, it's difficult to distinguish individuals on the recording. You know, if you have two, you know, Swains and Thrush who are counter calling, um, and especially if they're close to the recorder, you might not be able to hear much else. Certainly not black pole, the high pitched black pole warbler or a yellow bellied flycatcher that's 50 meters away. You may hear counter singing Swains and Thrushes. Um, so not only is it difficult to estimate the number of Swainsons, but it, it can mask the presence of other species who are further away from the recorder or singing less softly. Um, it's also really difficult to get a distance estimate for these recorders. If you're standing in a, in a habitat and you're recording the presence of singing birds, um, in mountain bird watch, it's generally by ear, but in other, um, other environments, there's a lot of visual detections. And you could see like, oh, I can range find birds 40 meters away. And that helps us create estimates of density around the plot for those birds by knowing what the, dis the maximum distance birds are detected within. If you don't have that, which you don't have from an automatic recording unit, you don't know how far the bird is away. And it's probably different for every species. The maximum distance the unit can detect 
you don't have the maximum detectable distance and you can't reliably estimate a, an, a, an estimate of density without using some you know, experimental data or some um, data where you, know, you had an actual human stand out there and measure the distance to singing Swainson's warblers and then brought that into your model with just automatic recording units. So you lose that. Um, also, automatic recording units. You know, I tell the observers for Mountain Birdwatch, uh, when the wind conditions reach a certain point, um, if the rain becomes too intense, they don't perform recording. They don't perform point counts. Um, the data quality are too poor. Automatic recording unit uh, doesn't necessarily know those rules either. Well, that's fascinating, just like... Uh... But I'm, so I'm, much of I'm very pro ARUs. I, I love I love that technology. It's got we have a bunch of them deployed right now in these really remote locations in Cuba um, that are inaccessible. They're military owned lands. We're not allowed to just like walk around. We put them out and like six months later go back and get them. They have a purpose. They are awesome technology. It's, they have a but human beings are still pretty awesome too. Well, maybe they'll pick up uh, some last remaining ivory billed woodpeckers in Cuba because I'll there's still some of that population might be hanging on, right? I'll let you know. You have me back for that program. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Hill, Jason, thank you so much. This is fascinating. And just, Thanks. I feel like we just scratched the surface of all the myriad research you've done. We didn't even hear as much about Hawaii and some of the other things. It's just it's mm -hmm. incredible. Um, so thank you, thank you, so thank you, and uh, and hopefully we can see each other in in person uh, before right too on. long. Yeah, and I, I thank you so much for being here, everybody. And and you know I do I, my email address was up there. It's just jhill at vtecostudies.org. Drop a line, just say hello. Um, interested in mountain bird watch? Great. Just want to say hello. Thanks for the presentation. That's that's great too. I just it's great to hear from people. Okay, great. Thank you. Well. Uh, Ken is going to close us out with a few words, and uh, thanks, Ken. Great. Thanks, Gabriel, and thank you so much, Jason. Uh, that was just such a, a fascinating uh, uh, report. Your your data is uh, truly incredible, and uh, uh, the world needs more like you. Um, so keep doing what you're doing. Uh, it's my hope that we could have you come back maybe in a couple of years when you have even more data um, and we, we could see what's left <laughs> or we could see what's changed. So uh, once again, um, great show. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, uh, it, it would truly be terrific to have you come back and uh, uh, have you present in person one day. Uh, so, uh, so let's hope for that. Um, I hope that everyone has enjoyed tonight's Linnaean program and that you'll all return next month when we will be presenting John Marsluff and Rendezvous with the Raven, exploring conditions among the trickster, wolves, and people. Until then, my very best wishes to you for continued safe and ethical birding. Stay healthy, stay active, stay positive, and a very good evening to all. <laughs>